Hey Pokemon fans, Almighty Arceus here, and wow, it's kind of been a while since I've talked to you guys. The last time I talked to you was when I was covering The Secrets of Galar Part 2, where I followed up on Eternatus, but missing from all of that was Zacian and Zamazenta, the box legendaries for Pokemon Sword and Shield. I have to say, out of all the box legendaries, these are possibly the ones we know the least about. They have so many mysteries surrounding them, and when I initially was going to cover them in part 3 way back before any of the DLC came out, I wasn't entirely sure where to go. I kept doing a lot of research about them and looking into the tapestries and the mythos and the lore that surrounded them in the games and in the plot, but there were still a lot of big questions that I had. I had no idea why they weren't able to Dynamax. I had no idea what their origins were or where they actually came from or how they really fit into the history of Galar. But then the Crown Tundra came out and with it a whole bunch of new lore and information about the Galar region. Now, of course, the Crown Tundra does focus on Calyrex and its whole adventures with its different forms, which we'll talk about in a later video. So you might be thinking, how does that help fill in the gaps with Zacian and Zamazenta at all? And you'd be surprised when you start pulling together the evidence that you find about the lore that surrounds the Crown Tundra and what happened there 20,000 years ago, you start to piece together the puzzle pieces of the mystery of Zacian and Zamazenta. So let's unearth all of the secrets and all of the lore waiting for us about Zacian and Zamazenta. The origins for Zacian and Zamazenta were only kept by unreliable accounts of truly mythic proportions, commemorated in mysterious relics that told an inconsistent story. What are Zacian and Zamazenta? What is their true role in the Darkest Day, and how are they related to Eternatus? Were they truly led by two heroic kings, or one valiant hero, or perhaps neither of those answers? And perhaps the most intriguing question to me, why can't Zacian and Zamazenta Dynamax? If they're made out of the same energy as all Pokemon are, Infinity Energy, they should be able to Dynamax, so what makes them incapable? To get this theory going, let's go over every single detail that we've been given about Zacian and Zamazenta directly from the games. Starting with their Pokedex entries, because this is where a lot of lore this generation exists, and let me tell you, both of their forms hold some very interesting information. First, we should note that in their base form, without their relic items equipped, they are each in the form known as the Hero of Many Battles form. This provides our first big hint about the nature of Zacian and Zamazenta. These wolves have fought in more than just the two or three darkest days that have been documented in the games, they have indeed fought in many battles across the history of Galar. Zacian's dex entries in the Hero of Many Battles form are as follows. Known as a legendary hero, this Pokemon absorbs metal particles, transforming them into a weapon it uses to battle. The Shield Pokedex entry goes like this. This Pokemon has slumbered for many years. Some say it's Zamazenta's elder sister. Others say the two Pokemon are rivals. Both Zacian and Zamazenta seem to have a similar ability to Melmetal, in that they're able to pull together molecules of metal to convert them into their armored forms. This may tie in with the wolves into some greater role that they may have had during the Kalos Galar War we spoke of in the last theory video. The other entry references that Zacian might be Zamazenta's elder sister, which is actually in reference to Morgan Le Fay from the King Arthur myths, a connection many Poketubers before have made. But Zamazenta's Hero of Many Battles Pokedex entries get a lot more interesting and give us our first big clue. In times past, it worked together with the King of the People to save the Galar region. It absorbs metal that it uses in battle. In S.H.I.E.L.D., it says this Pokemon slept for aeons while in the form of a statue. It slept for so long, people forgot that it ever existed. Both of these Pokedex entries are quite intriguing. In the Sword entry, Zamazenta is referenced to have worked alongside, quote, a king of the people rather than two kings, and stated generally to save the Galar region. No true timeline is given as to when this partnership with the king of the people took place. Some of you might see where I'm going with this. The Crown Tundra shows us a real king of the people that protected people and Pokemon of the Crown Tundra, and brought about prosperity to the people of Galar for a while, acting as king. 
So it's very likely that Zamazenta at one point worked with Calyrex, the king Pokemon and the king of the people, to save the Galar region. But it gets even more interesting when you start to add in Zenta's shield Pokedex entry, stating that it slept for aeons while in the form of a statue so long it was forgotten. Let's talk about those statues and what sleeping actually means in the Pokemon games. It's been a while since the death of a Pokemon was explicitly addressed. Gen 1 gave us the memorable episode with a Mother Marowak departing, and Gen 2 gave us the myth of the Ho-Oh reviving three dogs that had perished in the Burn Tower fire, and transformed them into the legendary dogs Raikou, Entei, and Suicune. Aside from that, death is dealt with in a very passive way primarily in the Pokemon games, with Pokemon existing either as alive or dead in a grave, sometimes as ghost-type Pokemon I guess too, which are reanimated in some way, but also kind of seem to be their own thing since they're literally their own Pokemon type. Let's talk about the fact that when you first encounter Zacian and Zamazenta, you see them through a thick fog. They come out of nowhere, they have question marks for their name and their level, you know nothing about them. You can't attack them either, your Pokemon's moves have no effect and they're just growling at you, basically telling you to get out of the slumbering world. Does that sound like anything else to you? That sounds a lot like the way that you encounter the ghosts in Pokemon Tower. And that's actually super important because that is the only other place in all of the Pokemon games where you have an encounter that mirrors that. There are no encounters anywhere else in which you're unable to actually fight or battle, where you have all those question marks appear, and where they disappear into a thick fog. There's nothing like that, except for in the Pokemon Tower. There is no act of dying in the Pokemon games from any Pokemon. We never see a Pokemon die in the Pokemon games, only their grave sites or cartoon ghosts that are ambiguously Pokemon of their own. Let's apply this to Zacian and Zamazenta as depicted in the fifth tapestry. You've got two kings sadly looking upon two apparent grave sites of Zacian and Zamazenta, with candles lit and it might as well have Alleluia by Leonard Cohen playing in the background. You can't get a clearer depiction of death than that. But Sonia said they're sleeping. So with all these context clues combined, yes, you can probably see where I'm going with this. Zacian and Zamazenta are Pokemon of the undead. I don't know why people didn't think about the Za part of the Zacian and Zamazenta name. Most people discounted that as being, oh, they're just saying the magenta and the cyan. And it's not the like SpongeBob might throw in there. I don't think it's the the at all. I think the za for Zacian and Zamazenta stands for zombie. That especially works when you put it into Zamazenta's name. Zombie magenta, Zamazenta, zombie cyan. Za Cyan. That's how it works. So, I know. It's a small thing, but I think it's something that is somewhat significant. Portmanteaus give a lot of meaning to what Pokemon actually are. The appearance of Zacian and Zamazenta with all these scars, all these battle marks on them, everything that they've taken in the many battles that they've had over the years, the fact that they're conjured like spirits out of their grave when you summon them with the sword and the shield up on top of Rose Tower, and the fact that they appear to you just like the ghosts appear in the Pokemon Tower, makes me believe that these are Pokemon of the undead. Zacian and Zamazenta were memorialized with grave sites when in truth their spirits were resting and regenerating over those aeons. And it's likely that aeons might even mean longer than just 3,000 years. It more likely means 20,000 years in which these wolves were guarding this forest, gaining energy from its hollowed ground. That is what Slumbering Wield really alludes to, the fact that this is where the sword and shield that you wield sleeps. So Slumbering Wield, Slumbering Weld. It is Slumbering Wield. Uh, I might mispronounce it. A lot of people do. Please don't come after me in the comments, but if you do, at least leave a like and then roast me. Like, I don't care. But this begs the question, when did Zamazenta and Zacian actually die? I mean, obviously they're depicted 3,000 years ago in that picture as having passed away, but they were able to revive after that, which leads me to believe that their powers of revival and being able to be reborn came to them before that moment. I don't think it was just born out of your inherent power. I think it was something that was given to them. It's important to talk about how Zacian and Zamazenta appeared to you in the climax of Pokemon Sword and Shield. 
when they appear, they burst out of their grave sites, and you see all these beams of energy beaming up and being summoned by the relic items, the rusty sword and the rusty shield. This suggests to me that their spirits are roaming the forest, but that their physical bodies, their physical manifestations, were actually buried in those grave sites, or perhaps regenerating somewhere else in the forest. I mean, we do see in the intro shot for Sword and Shield, uh, when the game was first announced, that they're sparring in the forest somewhere, and they sense some sort of force. So, they definitely could exist in that kind of way. I think, similar to other legendaries, they have this kind of ethereal mystic power where their bodies are able to kind of, you know, move around and, and teleport and, and phase through things. So, it's likely that even if they were actually buried there, their physical bodies were able to escape elsewhere and that they were able to manifest their spirits outside of those sites, but that they were resting, essentially, waiting for some sort of challenge or some sort of hero to arise once again in the Galar region uh, when it was most important. And we still haven't addressed how they're unable to Dynamax, despite being able to take on these Dynamaxing Pokémon why are they unable to? They're the two Pokemon that are unable to Dynamax out of all Pokemon. Well, we may have a partial explanation in the fact that they're undead. If they're truly undead, then it's not like you could necessarily absorb infinity energy in the same way that a live Pokemon might be able to, because you're not regenerating in that way. Perhaps they're regenerating in a different way. I'm not sure. Or perhaps they need that Dynamax energy, that infinity energy, to continue to regenerate. And if they exerted themselves too much, they might die again. I'm not sure. Uh, it does seem like there's some other explanations we might need to utilize. All of this is to say, I think there was some particular point in which they became associated with the Slumbering Wield. We still don't know when that was. There was some point in the past in which they were uh, granted these powers of immortality or regeneration, and where they were granted the powers of being able to feld these Dynamax and Gigantamax Pokemon. So, when could that be? Now, these were all mysteries that were not addressed in the original Sword and Shield games, but once the DLC came out, we got a lot clearer picture, and it all is because of the wonderful king Pokemon, Calyrex. The mythos surrounding Calyrex is really what's going to provide our answers here. Let's talk about what we know about it. We know that at some point, Calyrex moved an entire forest from the Crown Tundra to somewhere else when a meteor was about to strike. Now, we know about one particular meteor that is within the lore of Pokemon Sword and Shield, and that is the meteor that struck 20,000 years ago when Eternatus first fell to Earth. So I'm pretty sure that this is the same meteor that Calyrex was saving people from. We also know that Eternatus was somehow defeated back then 20,000 years ago. In addition to this big piece of lore, we know some of the special powers that Calyrex has. We know that it can regrow plants and cause bountiful harvests to flourish across the lands when it's at its full power. We know that it has the power to both heal and revive Pokémon. It always will heal its enemies and adversaries after battle because it is compassionate. It is known as a king of the people and one that provides for the people of the Crown Tundra and at one point, every creature in Galar back in the day. Now let's start pulling these things together a little bit. I mentioned the fact that Calyrex was able to grow forests and moved a forest 20,000 years ago. Now, not only is that meteor important, but the forest that Calyrex moved is important as well. There is only really one forest of significant note that's close enough to the Crown Tundra for Calyrex to be able to move it in a feasible amount of time to avoid a meteor strike. And that, of course, is the Slumbering Weald. That forest is really close. In fact, it's the closest forest that we have to the Crown Tundra. And it is also the forest that happens to be associated with Zacian and Zamazenta. So it seems really likely that the forest that was moved 20,000 years ago was the Slumbering Weald. Now is when it starts all coming together, because we know that if Calyrex moved the Slumbering Weald, and if the Slumbering Weald is associated with Zacian and Zamazenta, there is some sort of connection there. Now this is where the heavy theory stuff comes in. This is exactly what I think happened 20,000 years ago to actually provide the origins for Zacian and Zamazenta and their abilities to take on massive, gigantic Dynamax and Gigantamax and even Eternamax Pokemon. 20,000 years ago, this meteor was headed towards Earth, and Calyrex saw that heading towards the Crown Tundra and decided to move the forest that was there over to where its current location is. 
Within that forest were Zacian and Zamazenta. At the form, just hero Pokemon, warrior Pokemon is their actual dex classification, that decided to help out Calyrex and rescue all the Pokemon that lived in that forest, corralling them and moving them out of the region to get them out of the radius of the Meteor Blast. However, it seems likely that Zacian and Zamazenta were left behind, and they actually ended up perishing in the Meteor Impact when it hit where the Slumbering Wield used to be. And it's likely in that moment that Zacian and Zamazenta lost their lives. Calyrex, seeing the noble deeds of these two wolves, decided to imbue them with eternal life, and also equipped them with a magic sword and a magic shield, which would become their relic items. When equipped, they would become these powerful Fairy King Sword and Fighting Master Shield that were able to take on fearsome threats. And of course, right then and there, they faced off against Eternatus and were able to strike them down with their Behemoth Blade and Behemoth Bash. Fast forward 17,000 years, and Zacian and Zamazenta are still the protectors of the Slumbering Wield. Fair warriors and kings who were seeking aid in a crisis or a battle would go to the Slumbering Wield hoping that Zacian or Zamazenta would appear to them. If these fighters were noble enough, the magic sword or the magic shield would present themselves just like the King Arthur myth and Excalibur, and you would have Zacian and Zamazenta fighting alongside you in many different battles. That is, of course, why they're called Hero of Many Battles. They're not just within the three Darkest Day battles that we know. Many battles means that there's a lot of them. There's not just those major skirmishes, there's also the minor things in which they have fought in. But at some point 3,000 years ago, um, likely during the Galar Kalos Wars that were covered in part two, the beam of infinity energy from the ultimate weapon struck the Galar region and reawakened Eternatus with the influx of raw infinity energy. And with that, the second darkest day was upon us. The two kings of Galar came to the slumbering wield were presented with the relic items, and thus the crown forms of Zacian and Zamazenta appeared before them and fought once again against Eternatus. Now once again they were believed to have perished, and this was when the grave sites were constructed by the two kings in the Slumbering Wheel to honor them. Fast forward once again another 3,000 years and the third darkest day is once again upon us. You go to the slumbering wield and obtain the relic items at this point rusted and old, the rusted sword or the rusted shield, and you see these grave sites that have been deteriorated almost down to rubble over the course of 3,000 years or so. They present themselves to you and then once you're at top uh, fighting against Eternamax Eternatus, you raise these items to the sky and you summon the spirits of Zacian and Zamazenta once again at your aid. You remember how I mentioned the fact that Zacian and Zamazenta's armored forms are known as crowned forms in the Pokedex? I think that crown is pretty significant because who else can crown you but a king? The king Pokemon, Calyrex, that is yet another connection between Calyrex, Zacian, and Zamazenta. This explains a major unanswered question about Zacian and Zamazenta as to why they are unable to Dynamax. One of the reasons they can't Dynamax is likely linked to their powers in the first place, the fact that they're imbued with this power to fight back against Dynamax and Gigantamax forms. They're essentially the opposite, the opposing force, right? The immovable object and the opposing force, which is actually also a thematic connection between Zacian and Zamazenta, this immovable object and this unstoppable force. That's the sword, the unstoppable force, and the immovable object, the shield. It's very likely that that concept is interrelated. And that could be the relationship that they have with Dynamaxing and Gigantamaxing as well. They are immovable. They cannot have that Dynamax energy, that infinity energy infused in their being. But of course, that's really only when they're in their crown form. They're not necessarily equipped to fight Gigantamax and Dynamax forms when they're in their regular Hero of Many Battles form. So what could explain that? Well, probably being undead. Dynamaxing and Gigantamaxing seems to be some sort of projected biological process that takes place. It is inherent to the infinity energy within Pokemon. If you're undead, perhaps that biological process cannot happen. And especially being undead, when you're using borrowed energy, borrowed life force from Calyrex, it's probably unlikely that you're able to utilize other energy on your own. You are given that life through Calyrex. And Calyrex, as we know, has a very special quirk about their Dynamax. So that may actually be the reason why Zacian and Zamazenta can't Dynamax. 
but we'll have to talk a little bit more about that in part four. There's still so much to talk about when it comes to Dynamaxing, especially the mystic blue Dynamax that surrounds Calyrex and the mysteries that surround that as well. There's so much more to talk about his story, his lore, how Calyrex fits into the overall history of Pokemon and the Galar region. So in part four, I'm going to be covering that completely and bringing the Secrets of Galar theory to a close. Once we end that, we'll have a complete history that wraps around the Galar region and gives a lot more meat and depth to these legendary Pokemon that are within the Galar region. You probably have a lot of questions and comments and ideas and maybe even places you disagree with me or agree strongly and have more evidence about with this theory. So please post all of that below. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Y'all are posting a lot of great stuff on part two and part one. I really hope that you'll post more. I, I wanna hear your thoughts about all of this. I'm Almighty Arceus. Thank you so much for watching.